I'm Stephen Heppel, I'm professor of uh, uh, in UCJC and uh, professor of learning innovation, which is a lovely title. <laughs> It's at the foundation of everything we do are, are our learning spaces. But of course, learning spaces ended up being little boxes and we put people in boxes where learning spaces are all around us. It's the, the outdoors, it's the family, the community. One of our little schools in, um, in Madrid, Santa Isabel, which is a little tall building, the only play space is on the roof, but the whole of Madrid is mapped out as learning journeys so everywhere is a learning space and I think maybe the big change is that education you know is yesterday learning is today and education spaces were there learning is everywhere always we've we've neglected learning spaces for a long time I think Everybody watching this knows that um, learning out of doors sometimes was lovely, or learning in a learning in a place with ships, you know, in the background is uh, is beautiful. But we didn't take advantage of that. Now, what's happened with technology is we can measure the learning space. We can look at the, the light levels, the sound, the CO2, the pollution, the traffic noise. All of those impact on our learning. So. If you're in a room that's too hot and you open the windows, maybe you let out the CO2 and the heat, but you let in the diesel soot and you let in the noise. It's a very complicated thing to get it right. And there are probably 10 or 15 variables that really matter, including what we eat. Um, but none of them are difficult. So getting it right is complicated, but it's not hard. <laughs> but let's pick a few um, children have to move students have to move adults have to move you know standing here it's good my legs work muscles pump blood around my mouth so you need movement and you can achieve that even in a traditional classroom by zoning you have here's a place where we work just to talk one-on-one -on -one. here's a place where we rehearse our presentation to the world here's a place where I just have my head down and I'm working on my own and we move from one to the other the teacher sets a carousel of activities do some of this do some of this do some of this so they keep moving so movement really really important but also giving the students the data so they're sitting there but they're saying how noisy are we how hot is it how how many smiles we're at the moment we're measuring smiles in the aggregate you can't measure individual smiles because that would be an invasion of privacy but if you teach a whole class and nobody smiled for an hour, something wrong, you know. But maybe if you teach a class and they smile the whole time, you know, that's a, uh, there's no right answer. Having the data helps you to do that metacognition, that reflection on your own learning. When you think about how can my learning be better, it is better just by magic. The professional development of teachers is a real challenge. It's very controversial around the world. People are taking it out of universities, putting it into schools, taking it out of schools, putting it into universities. Children have to be a key part of it. You know, um, we do a lot of professional development where the children lead the professional development. So for example, if I'm, if I'm sitting in front of a table, there's a screen and it's what we call a, we used to call a Skype bar where we sit in a U-shape and we talk to somebody on the screen, hello, you know. Um, children know how to do that. They know that if you're the teacher, you sit at the head of the table, you face the screen, otherwise your voice will go all around the room and everybody will hear you, but if you face this way, you're just talking to the... Kids know how to do this. Um, so why wouldn't you have the children showing the teachers how to do it? Children know how to, how to use Harkness tables because They've read about it on TikTok. They, this is cool. Let's do it. You know, so why wouldn't they do it? You know, so kids have to be a part of all this. And anyway, 
if you go to the Kashmir or you go to Yemen or you go to many parts of the world, there aren't enough teachers. You know, 25 million children in Kashmir who will never have a million teachers to look after them. They won't even have 100,000. So the kids have to be part of the learning process. Mentoring each other, kids teaching kids. That means a mixed age, but when we put it, when we put everybody in the same age, we need a lot of teachers because it's really boring. Uh, when you say to kids learn from each other, it works better. So we have to reconfigure the whole thing and everybody's on a learning journey. The children, the parents, the teachers. We don't need special places for each of them. Really, really important. But what it did was it, it made people think again about their learning. Now they fell into two camps. People who said, we can recreate the classroom online. Hello children, it's 11 o'clock chemistry lesson. Have you got your books? That was never going to work because in the home, if I'm particularly in a poor family, you know, I don't have enough computers, I don't have enough connection, my mum is trying to work so I'm looking after the siblings, never going to work. But another lot said, online learning, we've known for 30 years, is very different to face-to-face -face learning. You, you introduce tasks over a longer period, they're more collaborative, you share with each other, um, you, you don't get everybody together at exactly the same time, but you say maybe I'll be here on Friday afternoon if you want to show me what you've been doing. So half the world tried to build an analogue of their already bad classrooms online, disastrously so, because the gap between rich and poor got worse, all the children were bored. The other half said, here's an opportunity to do it differently, how could we do it? And that lot are going fast, and this lot are going backwards, and there's a huge gap. And some of that is between countries, most of it is between schools. All the teachers are saying when the kids come back to school, they're more critical, they say, why are we doing this, why do we need to do this? I don't think they're going to go back. And I hope they won't, because these are the same kids who say, well, we're not going to go back to using a lot of petrol, we're not going to go back to burning fossil fuels, we're not going to go back to, you know, this is a, this is a generation of children who know we can do it better, and they know because they've been sharing it online. You know, you can, I mean, go into TikTok, sorry, to go into portrait for TikTok, but go into TikTok and look at the work children are exchanging in there. You know, Julie Smith's uh, um, child psychologist does work for children on, um, uh, you know, stress and well-being. She's got 30 million followers, huge numbers. Now, she wrote a, an academic paper, you know, maybe 20 people would read it. So suddenly children have got direct access to the people who are doing the good work and they're taking that access, they really are. So mine, um, I came to teaching directly from doing a degree, I did a good degree, went straight into teaching, didn't do my teacher training straight away, I did it in the evenings whilst there was already teaching, which you used to be allowed to do. And I inherited a group of children who had been entered for an exam which they thought they had no hope of passing because the schools were judged by how many children were entered, not whether they passed. So I sat down with this group of boys, all boys, and I said, look, you don't know anything about the subject. I'm really good at it. I don't know anything about teaching. So at the beginning of each lesson, I want you to watch the teachers around the school tell me what works, and I'll tell you how to pass the exam. By the way, all but one passed the exam which was everybody was like, how did that happen? It happened because they were reflecting on their learning, of course. But they told me so much about what makes good learning. First of all, it was things like how to scare. They said, you've got to, you've got to be like Arthur Harvey. When he gets cross, he gets really quiet and that's really scary. <laughs> then they started reflecting on, you know, expectation and collaboration. And you know, by the end of the year, they knew how to teach and so did I. And I learned more from then in a year than 30 years since. <laughs> mm. 
Oh, three really good things about being here. I mean, one is there's a big back channel running, a lot of conversations happening on Twitter. People are contacting me. There's a there's a whole you know education is as you learn is a little sort of tip of the iceberg. There's a mass happening. It's really exciting. I was part of that at the airport when I got on the plane. I landed. There were messages. So it's really it's got a feeling of a global buzz about it, which is really good. Secondly, conversations over coffee. You know, I mean, just standing there, people are coming up saying, oh, you said this, can I talk about that? You know, it's a high quality group of people. But actually, for me, I've spent real time going around the posters. And the posters are really good. You know, one or two are a bit crazy, it was higher education, you know, but, but something, a lot of really interesting stuff. I've learned lots, taken photographs, things I've taken back for other people. You know, and I think the poster session, it's one of those things that just gets forgotten really 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 good and I would say the last thing the technical setup here has been fantastic absolutely fantastic I carry I carry a bag of wires with me everywhere because technology is so bad usually at conferences I didn't even take them out of my room everything works that's really exceptional <laughs> that's a, four things really <laughs> and hey the weather five <laughs>